Could I have your attention, please? Could we have some silence in this large room, please? And a little bit of attention that I have as the president of the association is to recognize major significant contributions from our elected representatives toward the future of sound, balanced transportation in this country. And this year, it's a rare and true treat for me to recognize the contributions of Senator Paul Simon from Illinois, the leadership that he has displayed over the years for balanced transportation in this country, the leadership that he has displayed for balanced, more than just transportation, balanced government, a better life for all of us, for the environment, for energy efficiency, for sane government and for all of those things that have made this country great over the years. In the last six months, Senator Simon took a leadership role and a very creative role in addressing what could have been the end of a major rail service between Chicago. He took the bull by the horns. He got out front with a tough issue. He was able to work and to preserve that service. As a result of that, he's preserved many jobs. He's preserved transportation uh, viability and transportation options in a very important corridor of this country, and he's continued a leadership role that we have seen over the years. In recognition of his work over the years and in recognition of his work as the, in, in saving the Chicago, Missouri, and Western and bringing about a sensible resolution of those difficulties, it's my honor this evening, Senator Simon, if you'll come up here, please, to present to you on behalf of the National Association of Railroad Passengers the George Falcon Golden Spike Award for your work in balanced transportation and for your, your leadership in government. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jack, and my friends behind me from Illinois, and uh, all of you. I'm grateful to all of you. I think it's appropriate that you're meeting at this point. 
because uh, Sunday is Earth Day. One of the ways that we reduce air pollution, auto emission in this country, is by seeing to it that we maintain adequate and good, and I hope improved, railroad passenger service in this country. And uh, <laughs> while I am honored to receive this uh, award, and uh, I'm not going to give it back to you either, Jack. I, <laughs> the award really goes to all of you who've been fighting this battle. We start next week in the Senate marking up the budget when, once again, we're going to have to make the decision whether we go along with the administration or whether we maintain railroad passenger service. And I would love to tell you that it is my eloquence or the eloquence of any of my colleagues in the Senate or in the House that has maintained that railroad passenger service. It's people like you who have been willing to stand up and say, you know, it doesn't really make sense for the world's number one economic power to be the only industrial nation not to have decent railroad passenger service. We have a long way to go yet. And is, what we have to do is, frankly, not just maintain what we have, but we have to be looking to the future in terms of a solid financial base for Amtrak. We have to be looking at high-speed uh, rail development, and I'm supporting it, whether it's in Florida or Los Angeles to Reno, but let me just add a plug. I'm also looking to the day when we can have it between Chicago and St. Louis. I think it would be a great thing for, for the Midwest if we were to have that, and I'm willing to help, help it elsewhere. But uh, primarily my message to you, Jack, and to all of you is to say thank you, not so much for this generous award, which I am very grateful for, but primarily for what you're doing in standing up and seeing to it that this nation maintains some balance in its transportation. Without your help, we would not have that today. And so I am grateful to you, and there ought to be 250 million Americans also who are grateful to you. Thank you very, very much. are never going to be without money. And now it's turned out hardly any incumbent is ever without money. This is, from my view, and what worries some of my colleagues, I suspect, this is a challenger's bill. This will open up the process. This will allow people who are otherwise qualified and capable of running for office against incumbent Democrats and Republicans or independents will allow them the opportunity to do just that. And that's essential for the system. And last thing I'd like to suggest is that uh, we, um, we are, I am fearful, engaged in moderate reform. I forget who said it, but someone once said moderate reform is somewhat like moderate chastity. Um, uh, it, uh, it is, I don't know that there's any such thing as moderate reform. Uh, we have a bill, the Boren Bill, which I've co-sponsored, that I want to make clear my colleagues are not part of this, but in addition to adding the public financing piece, which is the biggest piece, I'm also going to try to eliminate all PAC contributions and some other amendments. The idea of cutting PAC contributions from $4,000 to $3,000 and saying we've done something significant, I find somewhat interesting. But the point is, this is the only significant significant change that I believe, if it is adopted, will do more to clean up American politics, increase the prospect of participation, and enhance the notion that whatever is passed is passed because it's the will of the people than any single thing we could do 
in the United States Congress on any piece of legislation. And uh, I think it's about time we face our colleagues with it, we get on with it, and face the American public with it, who I know some will tell us oppose public financing. But well, let's see. Let's go out and see if we can get that done. Uh, Senator Bradley. Um, I'm pleased to uh, join <coughs> with uh, my colleague John Kerry and Joe Biden in uh, co-sponsoring this legislation. I think that it's an important bill to it. As we all know, um, that was filibustered on the floor of the Senate, and it therefore failed to be enacted in all its components. And I look at this bill as an important enhancement of S-137, uh, dear to uh, a negotiation and a series of votes that will produce a uh, candidate is supportive of the overall campaign reform effort that's being made in the Congress this year. That's good. <laughs> so you ask any challenger who's considering running against Joe Biden in Delaware this year, you ask them if they will be guaranteed the same amount of money that Joe Biden will have in a general election, and I promise you, because the flip side of it is it's awfully hard uh, to raise more money than an incumbent who is relatively popular in his or her state. And so, Charles, the bill I originally introduced in 1974, challengers were guaranteed, assuming they didn't already hold statewide office, they were guaranteed 10% of what is the perfect to what is uh, even remotely pro probable. The idea that a challenger would have the same exact amount of who wants to uh, run against an incumbent who's not already in trouble. Well, let me, let me, if I, I just want to add to that, there, there isn't any question in my mind that this bill is an advantage. There isn't one incumbent United States senator who doesn't have the ability to spend more than, uh, than a challenger, with the exception of the challenger who is extremely rich and decides to put their own money into it. That's always been another problem which Senate 137 <laughs> seeks to address by equalizing the money they're going to spend. So, Bill, they want you for a question. Uh, do you want to do a quick question? Yeah. 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 campaign reform bill, and this campaign reform bill will deal with public financing. We've had public financing in New Jersey for gubernatorial elections for a number of years, although this is a voluntary public financing, meaning a voluntary tax checkoff. It's a little different than in New Jersey. It has worked well in New Jersey, and I don't see any reason why it shouldn't work well for senatorial elections. And, and for New Jersey. Okay, thanks, Joe. Appreciate it. Thank you, Bill. Let me just say, in the case of the New Jersey, there would be, uh, you have a unique situation because you obviously have no media market. Senate 137 takes that into account. But obviously, until this bill goes into effect, you've got to raise the money that you've got to raise. Voluntary means that it is a tax checkoff exactly the same system that currently funds the presidential elections. That, that checkoff has not been raised since 1974 when the bill passed. We would raise the checkoff from the current $1 per person, $2 a couple, to $3 and $6. We would direct the IRS to do what it has not been doing, which is to use public service ads to encourage people to participate, and also tax accountants and tax preparers to encourage people. That will raise more than enough money to cover the federal election for President of the United States and the Senate elections. The cost of the Senate elections in a two-year cycle is $60 million. What if you're, what if you're, what if you're Jay Rockefeller or John Hines and you've got uh, $60 million and you say, I don't want the public money, I don't need it, I'm going to spend it? Under the Supreme Court decision, they have the right to spend their money. And unless we have a constitutional amendment to change that and send